couple chapters in uh, 2 Corinthians 3. Sorry, Kenny, I didn't put these in there. But we'll be, uh, Kenny, we'll be at 2 Corinthians 3, 7 through all of 4. And then if you have a chance, you can look up uh, Hebrews 12, 1 through 3. Write it down. All right. Let's pray. Jesus, Lord, I thank you for your presence. I thank you for your anointing. Thank you for your gifts. And um, Lord, we just, we honor you. We give thanks this morning. It's the weekend of Thanksgiving. And um, Lord, we do, we enter in with Thanksgiving, enter in your courts with praise. And um, we just honor you this morning. Lord, we ask that you uh, speak to our hearts, minister to us this morning, and um, Lord, we continue to ask, as Dave and Amanda are on their way home from Wisconsin, Lord, we ask for their protection and uh, keep them safe, Lord, as there's rain and snow and all that stuff. In Jesus' name, anybody else traveling, we pray for protection on them too. Amen. All right. I'm going to read this in the NLT. Second uh, Corinthians 3, starting at verse 7. It says, uh, well, it starts out, the glory of the new covenant. Um, how many want to experience the glory of God? Amen? Uh, the word says that the, um, his glory will cover the earth as the water covers the sea. Right? And so um, I expect that, um, that in these coming days, these last days, that there's going to be a greater measure of glory um, being poured out on the earth, but really uh, in us. And we're going to read about that this morning, that I thought I got all those hairs this morning. <laughs> Getting old, I guess. Got hairs coming out of my ears. Um, but as we're going to read this morning, um, we are going to, we are the glory bearers. Amen. And so as the glory covers the earth, as the water covers the sea, I believe that that glory is going to be in his people and it's going to be shining out of his people and shining through his people. Um, it's not just going to be this, this glory that comes down and right his presence comes down, his anointing is there, but his glory is in us. All right, we're going to read about that here in a minute. The old way, the laws etched in stone, led to death, though it began with such glory that the people of Israel could not bear to look at Moses' face. The glory was on Moses, right? God passed by Moses, and the glory of Moses rested on him. And he carried that down the mountain, and as the people saw him, they saw that uh, they could not bear to look at Moses because of such glory. I believe that, that especially in the, in the last of the last days, I believe that there's going to be such... That, I mean, the glory is going to cover the earth like the water covers the sea. There's going to be this great glory that is on people. Right? The Bible says that the latter days are going to be greater than the former days. Well, this is the former, former days. Right? This was long ago. It says that, that it's going to be greater in the last days. His glory, I believe, is going to be greater. I think we can, we're going to have the, ex, the experience um, or the, the opportunity to experience God in such a great way that His glory is going to rest on us. And people are going to actually see Oh my gosh, what is on you? I can't hardly bear to look at you because there's such this glory. It's not a prideful thing. It's, it's something we walk in because of the, uh, the image. Uh, it's the image of God. It's what we reflect, right? We will reflect what we're looking at. 
For his face shone with the glory of God, even though the brightness was already fading away. See, that tells me that, see, Moses had this encounter with God, almost face to face, right? He said, look away because you can't really stand, and I'll just pass by. But by the time he got down the mountain, it was already starting to fade. So that tells me that it's not just a one-time experience to carry the glory. You don't have this one-time glorious experience with God, and all of a sudden you've got this glory on you that lasts the rest of your life. It's something you're going to have to experience on a continual basis to keep the glory on you. Right? Verse 8. Shouldn't we expect far greater glory under the new way? Right? So I just said it. The, the former is going to be greater than, or the latter is going to be greater than the former. Right? Shouldn't we expect a far greater glory under the new way now that the Holy Spirit is giving life? In the old way, which brings condemnation, was glory. If the old way which brings condemnation, was glorious, how much more glorious is the new way which makes us right with God? You don't have to go kill some animals and go to the priest and all that stuff. You just go straight to God and say, Lord, forgive me. You have this relationship with Him. You don't need Moses to go get the glory. You can go get the glory yourself in a relationship one-on-one with God. In fact, that first glory was not glorious at all compared with the overwhelming glory of the new way. So if the old way, which has been replaced, was glorious, how much more glorious is the new, which remains forever? Since this new way gives us such confidence, we can be very bold. We are not like Moses, who put a veil over his face So the people of Israel would not see the glory, even though it was destined to fade away. But the people's minds were hardened, and to this day, whenever the Old Covenant is being read, the same veil covers their minds, so they cannot understand the truth. And this veil has been removed only by believing in Christ. Yes, even today, when they read Moses' writings, their hearts are covered with that veil, and they do not understand. That's why it's important for us to pray for the Israelites, for, for Israel, that the veil be removed, that they, that they believe in Christ because it's through Christ and believing in Him that that veil is lifted so they, they can experience truth. But whenever someone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away, for the Lord is the Spirit, and wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom and liberty. Verse 18, so all of us who have had that veil removed can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. Isn't that awesome? You can see it, and, and, and that which you see, you will reflect, or you are to reflect. You're supposed to reflect. We're supposed to be image bearers of Christ, of God. And the Lord, who is the Spirit, makes us more and more like Him as we are changed into His glorious image. More and more, the more time we spend with Him, the more we get in His presence, the more we worship Him, the more we spend time in the freedom of the Holy Spirit, the more we begin to reflect and and, uh, experience the glorious image of God. And we we become changed and we look like Him more and more. All right, chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore... Since God in His mercy has given us this new way, we never give up. We reject all shameful deeds and underhanded methods. We don't try to trick anyone or distort the Word of God. We tell the truth before God, and all who are honest know this. If the good news we preach is hidden behind a veil, it is hidden only from people who are perishing, Satan, who is the God of this world, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. They are unable to see the glorious light of the good news. They don't understand this message about the glory of Christ, who is the exact likeness of God. You see, we don't go around preaching about ourselves. 
We preach that Jesus Christ is Lord, and we ourselves are your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let there be light in the darkness, has made this light shine in our hearts so that we could know the glory of God that is seen in the face of Jesus Christ. So it's the light that Jesus shines in us, right, that knows the glory of God that is seen in the face of Jesus. So if we're looking at Jesus, right, in the light of who He is, then we begin to reflect that glory that is on Jesus in His face, right? It, it, it's um, you really can know somebody a lot better by looking them in the face, right? If you just always walk around, hi, how you doing? Uh, good to meet you. Hi. You're really not going to get to know somebody, <laughs> right? And what if somebody came and said? Uh, did you, did you, you know, something happened, a crime happened, okay, and you're, you're in a, you're in a, a, a gas station, and somebody comes in, and you're like this, and they pull a gun on them, and blah, 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 you know, they get shot, they run out, and the police come and say, did you see what happened? Well, I saw kind of what happened. Did you see their face? Did you, can you identify them? Well, no, I can't identify them. I didn't look at them. I looked at their feet. I can identify their feet. They were wearing Nikes, Adidas. But if you put them in a lineup with different shoes on, I can't, couldn't tell you who they are. There is something about gazing on somebody's, I mean, not even just gazing, but I mean, really, to be intimate. You're not, you're not intimate with your partner and go, I love you so much. You really mean a lot to me. No, you look into their face. I love you so much. Right? You, you look at them eye to eye. Right? You, you gaze on them. That's, what, that's where we are going to really get into the glory of God. That's where we're going to begin to reflect the very image. It says it's on the face of Jesus, Right? Verse 6, for God who said, let there be light in the darkness, has made this light shine in our hearts. I love you with all my heart, right? So we could know the glory of God that is seen in the face of Jesus Christ. That is why God has been calling us to this intimacy. He, he keeps repeating this message and keep... I, I, I need to get more intimate with Jesus. All of us do, right? And he, he keeps calling us to this. He keeps calling, he's going to keep calling us to this until we're into the next season. But I, I believe it's because I hear it all over. I hear When I hear a teaching or something, I keep hearing different people. They're teaching on it different ways, but it all goes back to intimacy with Jesus. Intimacy with Jesus. Spending time with Jesus. Not just, not just a casual. Have you ever heard the... Uh, uh, expression maybe maybe Kevin's heard this uh, maybe uh, Ronnie has heard this uh, aim small miss small have you ever heard that never heard that phrase aim small miss small it's it's actually I I heard it first in a, in a movie um, I think it's called the Patriot with uh, um, Mel Gibson. And, you know, it's, it's, it's back in the, the Civil War and everything. And he told his son, he says, now remember, aim small, miss small. And what it means by that is if you have a target, okay, I'm not going to use a person, but let's say we have a target, okay, and the target is this big, and you just generally aim at the target. Okay, I'm just going to uh, somewhat aim at the target, okay. You're probably going to... I mean, you might hit close, but the odds are you're, you're going to miss pretty big. But if there's a little bullseye in the middle and you focus your aim on that little bullseye, you're probably going to miss 
less than if you're aiming at a bullseye this big. Does that make sense? So if you aim small, you're going to probably miss small because your focus is more I'm aiming right at the center of that target rather than a general, I'm just going to kind of aim at this bigger target. I think that is our, what our focus needs to be with Jesus. We can generally spend time with Jesus. I can generally spend time with him uh, while I'm on the forklift driving at work, you know, oh, I love you, Jesus, you know, whatever, you know, just kind of generally. But I think what he's really looking for is me to aim small, me to get in my closet at times and, and just intimately get with him and just spend time with him. Even if it's for a short period of time, he wants that intimacy where I'm looking at him face to face, we're connecting, and it's not just this general, hey, how you doing? Does that make sense? He's wanting us to gaze on his face because he's wanting to release that glory. He wants us to connect with that glory. The light in us connects with the glory on him. And what it does then is it reflects on us. Okay? Verse 7. We now have this light shining in our hearts, but we ourselves are like fragile clay jars containing this great treasure, this makes it clear that our great power is from God, not from ourselves. So it's, it's, a, it's a fragile thing that we have this light inside of us. And, and what I take out of that is it can be broken very easily. We can very easily get outside of uh, this, this aim small, miss small, this getting connected with him face to face right? It's, it's a delicate thing. Uh, it's not, he's saying it's not just, I don't want this general broad thing. I want this, I want you to carry this with, with as though it's very precious to you because it's very fragile. This light inside of you that is going to help you reflect the glory of God because it, it bears witness. Uh, it's, it's this thing that God wants you to carry with, with um, not an arrogant pride, but carry with pride that I'm going to protect this thing. I'm not going to do things and let things happen in my life that will distract me from uh, what could break my jar that contains my light, right? And, and there's so many things that the devil wants to get you involved in or, or get you distracted with that can break your jar and, and your light is then uh, extinguished, right? Right? And, and we don't want that. We want our light to shine. Verse 8. We are pressed on every side by troubles, but we are not crushed. Right? Now, now think of this as this fragile clay jar containing this great treasure, it says, right? Verse 7. We now have this light shining in our hearts, but we ourselves are like fragile clay jars containing this great treasure of light. Right? Now, now read verse 8. We are pressed on every side by troubles, but, we're, but we're, even though we're this fragile jar, we're not crushed. We're perplexed, but we're not driven to despair. We are hunted down, but never abandoned by God. We get knocked down, but we're not destroyed. Through suffering, our bodies continue to share in the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be seen in our bodies. Yes, we live under constant danger of death because we serve Jesus, so that the life of Jesus will be evident in our dying bodies. So we live in the face of death, but this has resulted in eternal life for you. But we continue to preach because we have the same kind of faith the psalmist had when he said, I believed in God, so I spoke. We know that God who raised the Lord Jesus will also raise us with Jesus and present us to himself together with you. All of this is for your benefit. And as God's grace reaches more and more people, there will be great thanksgiving. Amen. As This is a weekend of thanksgiving. There will be great thanksgiving and God will receive more and more glory. So as our light, as we, as we reflect on the face of Jesus and we focus on Him, our light bears witness to His glory. 
His glory is then shown on our face and on, our, on, on, on us. And then the glory that we have in us, right? It said earlier that we know that um, this is... Um, we don't, don't go about preaching ourselves. We preach that Jesus is Lord and ourselves are your servants for Jesus' sake. We, we know that it's not about us, it's about him. So then that glory that he has filled us with then is reflected back to him, uh, giving him glory and honor for what he has done for us. Right? God will receive more and more glory. That is why we never give up. Though our bodies are dying, our spirits are being renewed every day. For our present troubles are small and won't last very long, yet they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. Last for the, all of eternity. So we don't look at the troubles we can see now. Rather, we get eternally minded, right? We fix our gaze on the things that cannot be seen. For the things we see now will soon be gone, but the things we cannot see will last forever. So getting our gaze on the right thing, getting our gaze on Jesus' face, which, which we can't see right now in the natural, right? But we get our gaze fixed on that, and His face lasts for all eternity. His glory lasts for all eternity, right? And that's what we get our gaze on, and that's what we get our focus on. Uh, one more scripture. Go to Hebrews 12. Verse 1 through 3, 4. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up, let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now he is seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. Think of all the hostility he endured from sinful people, then you won't become weary and give up. After all, you have not yet given your lives in your struggle against sin. So he's wanting us to keep our eyes on him, right? We do this. We run the race set before us without being tripped up by setting our eyes on him, setting our focus on him. The only thing I had written down was he wants us to be image bearers and glory carriers. You've probably heard that before. He wants us to be image bearers and glory carriers. And that's how he's going to reach the people on this earth. Amen? It's through you and me. Through you and me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.